G'day everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the, uh, some of the project work that I've been involved with as an ecological consultant uh, pertaining to the recreation of Wallum wetland habitat for a, a group of threatened frog species collectively known as acid frogs. So what are acid frogs? Well there are four recognised acid frog species that occur in coastal uh, Queensland and New South Wales. They include the, oh, there we go, what's happened? They include the uh, Wallum sedge frog, the Kalula sedge frog, and a couple of terrestrial species, the Wallum froglet and Wallum rocket frog. And these species occur in what is known as the Wallum country. And that's an area of uh, uh, sand plains and sand dunes and dune islands along the southeast Queensland coast and uh, New South Wales coastline uh, that it's uh, characterised by nutrient-poor, silica-rich soil. So that's that area bounded in white here. And the acid frogs of the Wallum breed in perched wetlands. So perched swamps, lakes and soaks like those depicted here. And for those of you not familiar with the term perched wetland, what these wetlands are, these are wetlands that are formed above an indurated layer a layer of um, material that's um, uh, largely impermeable or semi-permeable to water. So it retards the movement of water down through the soil profile. So that water doesn't just go straight down to the deeper aquifer, it's actually perched on top of uh, an indurated layer. And in the Wallum uh, systems, you find that that indurated layer is composed of coffee rock, which is a conglomerate of organic fines and sand. And it's under pressure, it forms uh, almost like uh, a rock, I guess. Hence the term coffee rock. One of the distinctive features about these perched Wallum wetlands uh, is the unusual water chemistry that you find in these wetlands. They're poorly buffered and they are highly acidic down to pH 3 due to the presence of dissolved organic acids. Uh, they're also very dilute, they're iron poor, so very low conductivity, the waters are very soft and typically they're heavily tannin stained due to the presence of coloured organic acids. And because of this unusual water chemistry, these perched Wallum wetlands are inhospitable to most other frog species and a whole heap of other aquatically respiring um, vertebrate species. So fish struggle with these sorts of conditions too, and some species do at least, and the majority of native frog species do as well. So these acid frogs are, are specialised to these acidic environments, these naturally acidic perched Wallum wetlands. The acid frogs are all listed as vulnerable under New South Wales and Queensland legislation with the exception of the uh, Kalula sedge frog, which only occurs in Queensland. And they are uh, under threat from habitat loss, fragmentation and degradation, especially in coastal areas of uh, southeast Queensland. Other threats to these species include competition with more common sibling species in areas of marginal or degraded wallum habitat, in particular where you get a change in the water chemistry things like elevated pH or increased nutrient loads, but elevated pH in particular where you get surface runoff uh, going into these perched uh, wetlands. And predation by exotic fish, in particular mosquito fish and platy. Now mosquito fish are actually surprisingly acid tolerant, so unlike a lot of other fish species that would struggle in the naturally acidic waters of the Wallum, they actually uh, do quite well. And in South East Queensland we've got a growing problem with platy as well. Um, that's probably becoming more common in a lot of these wallum wetland habitats than mosquito fish. So we've got loss and fragmentation and degradation of habitat as a growing problem in coastal areas of South East Queensland and also increasingly in northern New South Wales. So there's now attempts being made to offset the loss and degradation of that habitat by recreating acid frog habitat. So if you're going to do that, we need to be mindful of some very specific requirements for successful uh, recruitment of acid frog species. So these are the things we need to be able to achieve if we're to successfully recreate the habitat for these species. And there's quite a long list here, so it's no easy task by any means. Firstly, we need to make sure that that water chemistry is right, that it's the water chemistry that these acid frogs love and that the other frog species don't like so much. So we're trying to keep out the competitors by maintaining low pH, dilute, clear tannin stained water in these wetlands. You also need to think about pond hydropyr. It's critical for amphibian species, the majority of which have uh, tadpoles as part of their life stage. They need to be able to complete that larval period and they need a certain amount of time to do that. In the case of acid frog species, we're looking at a, a hydro period, a period where we've got water present um, 
for eight weeks or greater. What's also important is seasonal drying because that keeps a check on the densities of aquatic predators. So if fish happen to get in the system, if the wetland dries out, it's sort of resetting things back to zero. But there are also other important predators like dragonfly nymphs and um, damselfly nymphs and uh, crayfish, and their numbers can also be uh, suppressed by the seasonal drying. It's also important to provide areas of shallow open water that are favoured for spawning by some of the acid frog species. And what's very important is keeping predatory fish at bay or having them there only very occasionally or at very low densities. And trying to create an environment that is inhospitable to competitive frog species is really critical. Um, and in the case of the Wallum sedge frog, you need to have sedges in there as well, as the name implies, quite obviously. So that's essential for the, the Wallum sedge frog, which was also listed um, federally. So I've been involved in various ways in a number of projects where there's been an attempt made to recreate um, habitat for one or more of these species. The intent is to provide uh, breeding opportunities for those species. That's not so um, favourable for other competitor species. And um, so my involvement in these projects has been largely looking at the efficacy of those efforts by doing some monitoring. Um, with the last project, I was able to actually have a bit of input into the actual recreation of habitat. So the first project um, that I got involved with was a, um, a road upgrade at Tawanton, north of Brisbane. And what happened here was there was a, um, a road put through an area of uh, Wallum froglet habitat and then an attempt to offset the loss of that breeding habitat by digging a few ponds uh, alongside an elevated roadway here. And this is kind of what you see when you're on ground here. There's the elevated roadway there, and there's some sedges that have been planted. So what was done there? There were a series of small ponds created, six to eight metres squared, a shallow, so less than 0.4 metres deep. They were constructed amidst spoil and mulch over a sandy loam. So a bit of a dog's breakfast in terms of the soil profile there. Um, they were planted out with sedges, baumia and liparonia species, which are the common species in the acid frog uh, habitat. And these particular ponds received a bit of runoff from the, uh, the immediate surrounds, including the road embankment. So how did these ponds fare in terms of providing breeding habitat for the wild froglet? Well, the water quality was reasonable, so that the upper end of um, where we want things to be for acid frogs. There were no competitor sibling species present there though, so that wasn't so much of an issue, more by virtue of the isolation of the site from, um, from other wetland areas. There were no fish in the ponds, which is always a good thing, but where these ponds uh, failed was with regards to providing that adequate pond hydro period, giving larvae a long enough time to complete the development so they pop out as little frogs. Um, so we had breeding there on a number of occasions, even um, here yeah, maybe two or three occasions, but there was no juvenile recruitment. So why were we having this problem with juvenile recruitment? Well, quite simply, they had altered the site drainage dramatically. And this is the number one problem. Um, when I saw this, when I first turned up on site, I pretty much knew it was all over. This is a fauna underpass, which was uh, <laughs> subterranean and also uh, uh, subaquatic almost, really. Um, and that had taken some of the surface water that should have ponded on the other side of the road down across through the culvert to the other side of the road and was also lowering the groundwater table. So in these wallum wetlands, I, I mentioned before, you've got to have a uh, contribution of groundwater uh, perched above an organic hard pan, but here they're effectively draining that groundwater as well as draining any surface runoff. So it was doomed to failure. Um, needless to say, the fauna underpass was hugely unsuccessful as well. Um, so the second case study is uh, at Burpengary, again north of Brisbane, probably about 40 minutes drive, where there was an attempt to again create breeding habitat, wetland habitat for um, acid frog species, the Wallum froglet, to account for the loss of habitat from this area here where there's some AFL playing fields constructed. This is the area where the uh, offset ponds were created, uh, adjoining an area of existing breeding habitat and nearby another area of breeding habitat. But you'll note here a creek line in very close proximity to this um, offset area. So the ponds were, as I've already mentioned, constructed adjacent uh, areas of existing breeding habitat. So you can see one of the ponds here. Oh, crikey. Uh, actually, we're going too far. Hang on. 
There we go. We can see one of the ponds here. And there's some existing habitat, very small amount along the fire trail. That's breeding habitat for the Wallum froglet. These ponds were a little larger, around about 10 metres squared in size, mostly shallow again, so only to about 0.4 metres below ground level uh, at their lowest point. They were situated in sandy loam or a clay loam. They were planted out with sedges, the same species I mentioned before, and these ponds received runoff from the immediate surrounds in most cases and a, a contribution from the groundwater too, where the water table was a bit shallower. So what was the fate of these ponds? Well, very early on it was clear that most of the ponds were not holding water for anywhere near long enough to provide breeding opportunities for these frogs, or any frogs really. So there was a direction given to, okay, try and dig these ponds out, make them a bit deeper, um, and that's what was done. And you can see a couple of the ponds that have been deepened here, holding lots of water, which turned out to be a bit of a curse in the end. So what were the outcomes here? Um, in this case, there was breeding and uh, juvenile recruitment in a couple of ponds, but only under unusually wet conditions. Uh, so that only occurred once. And the frogs, uh, sorry, the tadpoles did metamorphose, and so there was successful recruitment, but that's never been repeated, and that was some time, like five years ago now. So what went wrong? Most of the ponds were, again, too dry. They just didn't hold water for long enough. And there are two problems here. There was limited interception of groundwater, which is probably the key thing, and also some of them were receiving very little in the way of surface runoff. So there was just no chance that most of these ponds were, were going to work in the first place. The problem that I alluded to before with the ponds that were made deeper to intersect groundwater was that we ended up with permanent water. And when there was heavy rainfall, gambusia and other fish species, uh, so gambusia is the plague minnow or um, mosquito fish, would find their way into these ponds, which now held water for almost the entire year. These are the deeper ponds. And the fish could breed up in those, and then they could get to other areas of breeding habitat. So what went wrong here was the failure to consider the potential of fish to get into these all oh, crikey. It's time's flying by. Anyway, so uh, not much luck there. Case study three is uh, more of a success story. So here I did get to give a bit of direction, having learned from those two previous case studies that um, we needed to address a few issues like intercepting groundwater and also um, making sure we didn't get fish into these ponds. So here we had 12 vegetated ponds created for three of the wallum uh, frog species I mentioned before, set back from a nearby creek, so that's the area in red where the ponds were created. There's a quick schematic showing the layout of the ponds. Ponds of various sizes, some larger, some smaller. Uh, maximum depth in this case was about uh, 600 millimetres or 0.6 metres below ground level. And in this case, there were some investigations of groundwater hydrology and soil profiles prior to construction, looking at depth to groundwater and water quality, making sure that we were going to tick those boxes. So ponds in this case were constructed in areas where the groundwater we knew was going to be shallow. We knew that the groundwater uh, chemistry was right. We had sandy soil with organic, organic fines, a source of organic acids. There was coffee rock beneath the sand. And here we again, we planted out the ponds with sedges. And in this case, we had some success. We had excellent water quality, ticking all the boxes there, really low pH, lovely tannin stains, very clear. Fish were entirely absent because they were, these ponds were situated well back from um, the, the creek which had fish. Um, competitive sibling species were occasionally present, one species, the striped rocket frog, but they weren't breeding there because they couldn't tolerate those acidic conditions. So in this case, we had successful recruitment of wallum, froglet, wallum rocket frog and wallum sloot frogs in the larger ponds there. But there were still problems with what was uh, attempted there and that we weren't getting recruitment in the smaller ponds uh, where the pond uh, hydro period was too short. So even though those ponds were originally about 0.6 of a metre deep, because they had much steeper sides, you've got sands just slipping into them and, and filling in the middle. So they were actually much shallower. Um, I could uh, go in detail to the summary recommendations, but um, I guess those case studies speak for themselves. So the thing to consider really is Hydro period as being an important um, determinant of the suitability of uh, breeding habitat for these species. Soil profile and uh, groundwater. So with these groundwater dependent wetlands, you really have to um, think carefully about intercepting groundwater, getting the pond bathymetry right, the layout of the pond, and making sure that you get the soil profile right too because you don't want to have um, the wrong water chemistry. So I've kind of uh, truncated my summary and conclusions there, um, but if anyone has any questions, I can go into more detail about the uh, associated recommendations. So, um, yes, thank you. Thank
Okay, we have Yi Shong uh, now from Singapore. So thank you. Um, I'll give you a warning when you're triggered. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my topic this afternoon, integrated solution for ecological restoration and management of uh, tropical freshwater shrimp forest. And my voice too soft. Okay, um, the area we're talking about is a part of Singapore. Singapore Island is in the south um, tip of Malaysia Peninsula. I thought you know where is it. And um, the area that we're studying on is on middle, and uh, they are surrounding by three uh, reservoirs, which are complicated in the hydrological process of uh, freshwater storm habitats. And the total area uh, about 500 hectares for the catchment. But the, since the eight of these uh, reservoirs, although they are not inside this catchment, but uh, the underground is uh, significantly uh, linked to the reservoir. So we are include this inside our study area. It's a low land area, about one to 80 meter high only. And, um, this it occupies about 1% of uh, Singapore Island, but they are holding a high endemism. That currently, three uh, freshwater crab species endemic to Singapore Island. Two of them are found inside this uh, swamp forest. And uh, there are continual discovery of uh, small species, fauna. Uh, for example, this. Uh, just recently found a new record to the country and the sick fish species here is uh, only found in this um, habitat, not other part of Singapore. Um, there are one third of the vegetation of the whole uh, island found from this one uh, percent of land, 50 percent of dragonfly and you um, can see that how important the particular freshwater swamp to Singapore Island and dramatic change that had happened to uh, the surrounding due to mostly urban development, agricultural housing, and contrary uh, report of increasing water and decreasing water level. Uh, here, there are different people with different view. Many of them is uh, very unclear. So that's why we uh, initiated the study since 2011 through uh, three state, and now is the ongoing uh, phase three to investigate the various hydrological and biological process within this particular swamp forest, understand the interaction between them and include past change, predict future changes, and design solutions for mitigation and rest restoration. It has this long-term monitoring um, protocol for future conservation program. <coughs> um, you can see baseline has it has this through the last uh, four years of study. And in terms of hydrology, we have um, major. Uh, we have collecting a lot of samples uh, regarding the water, surface water, groundwater <coughs> level, and uh, water quality. We also try to determine the source of water, whether they are mainly come from rainfall or they are coming from the reservoir. And um, soil investigation also doing the same time. How being analyzed, this uh, um, heavy metal uh, also analyzed for the whole catchment. And this too is actually a monetary um, life fighting area. So in fact, this area have much higher heavy mantle as compared to other parts of the storm. Pollen was attracted to look at the history of vegetation. And uh, we also look at the total organic compound in the storm area. For aquatic fauna, um, 
through uh, last four years, the species have been updated. And the vegetation, we said that 40, 20 times 20 block a crossing from the dry to the wet area, the whole swamp area. And um, based on the understanding of hydrological process, water cycling, and at the same time, we take into consideration of Singapore's particular case. In Singapore, water is a high um, national interest, and even in a 21-4, when a very dry season, we have a, a lot of water through this uh, desalinization and uh, new water a program which are uh, recycled water outer treatment to add into the reservoir, add into the reservoir so that to keep all reservoir at all time almost at the maximum level. So uh, the rainfall gate has been uh, installed to collect the rainfall information, ground water, stream flow, and um, the lead area intake through just now mentioned the vegetation study in the 40 block and also the root depth to look at how the plant will uh, consume the water from the swamp itself. At the same time, we have a very good historical record from our reservoir operator. And uh, atop this uh, mic seat, which is developed by um, GHI and um, click around based on the Singapore condition. And uh, based on uh, climate change uh, model, which uh, predict the next five years of extreme dry and extreme um, wet condition, come out with these 12 scenarios, which are basically uh, when there are no rain continue for the five years and the reservoir level is low, so this is the case. Medium uh, reservoir level, the result after five years will be this. This uh, look at the, the surface water only. And um, as we mentioned, Singapore is a keep of reservoir water very high level. So this is most likely the, the case that in the next five year time. And similarly, these are the prediction for the groundwater level uh, to reflect the 12 scenario after five years. And, um, and the catchment we divided to study area to eight, uh, eight sub catchment. So these are each sub catchment, current situation, uh, the most dry situation and most wet situation to uh, predict the future scenarios for the swamp forest. And um, we choose the high reservoir level and um, no water, no rainfall for the extreme dry condition. And in this case, when they happen, the possible mitigation measure could be suggested to use the point source surrounding this area. This is the catchment water all flowing down here. And in that case, uh, the point source we have to be using um, farm and tap because uh, they are higher elevation compared to the reservoir water level. And the, the water, uh, daily water to be farming is uh, similar to current uh, discharge. The second choice is uh, to use uh, the only tap which is uh, more closer to the uh, stream lower part of the catchment. So this elevation is lower than the reservoir water level. You don't have to using pump, but just using tap directly connected, and the water will be coming from the one, two, three uh, reservoir to mitigate the dry condition. And uh, this uh, after two year time, we compare the A and B the condition. As the A is the pump and tap, B is the only tap. But the water is more closer to the uh, catchment. So the result saw that 9A resulted in groundwater table closer to the um, ground surface, 
and this uh, bump and type can provide larger cover, um, as uh, you mentioned, with uh, further up the hill. And for surface water, um, <coughs> 9A resulted in groundwater uh, closure, so it is um, Nine B, uh, the survey water um, has a better uh, covering as a compared to nine A because the, the water is a, the tank is a more close to the uh, stream and water is a running uh, quite fast. So uh, resulted in larger survey water extent than nine uh, A. So this this nine B is a uh, um, more suitable for the storm. Next is uh, the flooding. The next five year time, when they are continual or high level of rainfall, so this will be the, the scenario that we might be facing. And if that happen, the red color will be indicate uh, the excess flooding area compared, compared to the normal operation level. Then after two year time, this will be the about 20.9 he hectare of water in this lower uh, catchment area. And how are we going to cope with it? Uh, this kind of ponding naturally found now in uh, some part of the freshwater storm, and we feel that this is a very good uh, uh, model to retain the water and make it ecologically more friendly. So our solution would be proposed based on the particular location to look at so uh, impact, minimize the impact to propose the retention pump position and the size. And uh, we also understand that um, the fauna will be affected during a very dry period. And the vegetation through this uh, uh, soil and the, wood, um, the tree itself, the root system, the growth of tree, be affected by the uh, flooding. And currently we are ongoing study to try to understand based on sibling, small tree, large tree, and uh, to understand how the tree ecological, to develop an ecological model, how uh, vegetation will be uh, respond to change in hydrology. And this will be tapped on, on the jump now we mentioned about the hydrological model and the storm itself to uh, understand in what particular extreme case the management should be triggered to conduct all those uh, uh, management measures. So we also are doing a restoration to based on current understanding to propose a certain treatment, for example, uh, reforestation of the stream aquarium and stream channel improvement. And um, at the same time, outside the forest egg, because of reservoir operation, very often reservoir bring a lot of um, invasive species just in the outskirts of the Eastern uh, Swamp Forest. So uh, our selection is uh, to start from EG to typical riparian um, forestation most can be uh, start now. Then uh, the next step will be stream channel improvement and uh, where to prevent uh, backflow and also try to uh, see possibility of doing stream diversion to escape this part. And thank you. to see uh, 
Thank you. Um, I'm here to tell you today about my PhD research um, that I did at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch, working with a team of freshwater ecologists uh, as part of an eight-year stream rehabilitation experiment called the CARIX project, the Canterbury Waterway Rehabilitation Experiment. So within the CARIX framework, um, we had the challenge of working in an agricultural landscape, the Canterbury Plains, um, and I'm hoping that there'll be a lot of familiar chord stock with you in the audience. Um, this is a landscape impacted by multiple stressors, high sediment, high nutrients. Um, we're trying to develop practical restoration tools working alongside of existing land use without taking land out of production. Um, so these, these are the types of implementation challenges that we had to deal with. And in my PhD, I was really just addressing nitrate because that's one of the big, biggest nutrients that we have to deal with regionally. So these are what our streams look like. Um, people locally call them drains because uh, they are agricultural drainage ditches. 80% um, of the wetlands have been drained from this landscape, the native bush has been cleared, and sort of our, our remnant freshwater habitats are first order, second order streams that are spring fed. Um, you can see there's fencing, which is sort of the standard management practice at the moment, at the moment a two meter narrow riparian buffer with some grass, maybe some sedges, and a fence. My, one of my co-supervisors, uh, Catherine Fabria, will be talking to you on Thursday afternoon about some of the challenges that we had to address about scaling up, um, trying to do stream rehabilitation in, at the landscape um, in sub-catchments and uh, the importance of working with the farmers and the landowners in this. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Canterbury Plains, this is a map of, of the Canterbury region. Christchurch is, is just here for you to orientate yourselves. And this heat map are groundwater nitrate nitrogen data sampled by the Regional Environmental Council. So there's over 300 wells shown here. Um, this, these are each sampled once in the spring of 2016, the most recent data that we have. And so the blue dots are showing nitrate concentrations less than three milligrams per liter, nitrate in, all the way up to well over the safe um, World Health Organization drinking water limit of 11.3. Um, but what you can start to see already is there's a landscape level impact, a legacy of nitrate that's in the groundwater from, from land use past. Um, but current ongoing intensification, uh, expansion of dairying, especially in the last 20 years, there's more inputs going into the system. And so while nitrogen, um, primarily coming from fertilizer application, urea is a land-based problem, it's also connected to the groundwater and surface water. So these nine stars are nine waterways that we studied within the CAREX project. And we stratified them across this groundwater gradient to capture uh, any patterns that might be happening in the region. Here's a simple conceptual diagram of what these look like. They're channelized, straight in ditches, meant to move water from point A to point B as fast as possible. Um, so in the case of Canterbury, there's this strong groundwater linkage. The groundwater is upwelling from springs, seeps, um, and these are headwaters, so they're gaining water as they go down the reach, um, and increasing in, in inputs of nitrogen from groundwater and groundwater inputs along those reaches. Also, from, from the sides, we've got lateral inputs from other tributaries, open drains, um, riparian seeps, as well as networks of buried pipes. So these are similar to stormwater pipes, um, but these are tile drains. These are designed to intercept shallow groundwater table, but also capture soil water. And what's tricky about these is that they intercept uh, the riparian protection network. So any genetification we might expect to be happening in the riparian zone, these are effectively short-circuiting that. And so we set up with a lot of questions um, this being a typical network configuration for these systems, um, we had some fundamental questions about figuring out how much nitrate was in the groundwater coming up as loads in these streams, how loads were being accumulated downstream, and what the drivers were. So we had these nine waterways that we sampled um, one kilometer reaches of. Um, and seasonally, we took samples at the downstream ends, uh, which we'll call catchment outlets, as, long as, as well as two or three sections within the reach and upstream as well as the tile drains and open drains when they're flowing. So we had four years of data from these nine waterways across this region um, that were sampled seasonally. And I won't show you the data today, but um, we had some really strong patterns that emerged where wet seasons, um, autumn and winter especially, are where we had the highest loads, and those were exasperated in wet years. The data I'm present now are actually the, the daily fluxes. So these were calculated by taking a, a nitrate grab sample and measuring discharge, 
And the flux that I'm talking about is a daily load, so kilograms of nitrate nitrogen per day. Um, so these are the, the waterways coded by catchments on the x-axis and daily flux on the y-axis. Um, these are mean values with 95% confidence intervals. So this is the summary of the, the data from the four years. Um, essentially what's happening is these sites are following the same gradient in groundwater that we saw on the heat map um, with an increase in water coming from larger streams. Um, so to the right, some of these streams are a bit larger than the streams on the left. So we know that load coming from the stream is, is increasing with these groundwater inputs. But we also wanted to know what it looked like from these edge of field sources um, that could be important mitigation or places to target our rehabilitation. So I've added these, these hollow points now. These are the means and 95% confidence intervals for those edge of field sources. Um, and we can see that there's a, sort of a similar gradient. Um, they track very, sim very similarly to the catchment outlet fluxes, um, but with a lot of variability in there. So a lot of changes in these things seasonally. Um, the tile drains can be very flashy in their flow. <coughs> There was a further analysis that helped to guide to contextualize this um, that I won't get into today, but um, essentially from this we can see that there are some points we do have some really high loads in these waterways and also in the edge of the field um, that might be good places to target our rehabilitation tools. And so the, the recipe that we're trying to do here is to enhance the nitrification. Um, these waterways are very low in organic matter. Um, they have accumulations of, of aquatic macrophytes of, of bank-based emergent vegetation. Um, but those are actually removed annually by mechanical clearance. Um, so any organic matter community is being removed from the water. We know that a carbon source is important to turn nitrate to nitrogen gas. Um, so a common recipe with these real rehabilitation tools to boost denitrification means adding a carbon source, enhancing uh, microbial contact, and providing sufficient residence times. Um, this is really a challenge in these drains where we're trying to essentially move water from the landscape. We're removing carbon. So right away we can see some of the hurdles just from a biogeochemistry standpoint that we're having to address. Um, actually, there's a, lot, there's a lot of locations. So I, I showed the tile drain data um, to stimulate thinking about edge of the field. So essentially where the fence or paddock stops and where the repairing zone might start. Um, there's a few different mitigation options that we have there. One that I trialed with my PhD are denitrifying bioreactors. Um, these are essentially large filters um, where you pipe nitrate in from a tile drain, um, use a carbon source like wood chips to treat the nitrate, and then the nitrate entering the stream um, is much lower than what's going in. We can also work in the repairing space. Many people here will be familiar with repairing planting, repairing wetlands. Um, we also tried to work with communities and farmers to look at what species of plants uh, were ideal in terms of providing organic matter and shade and um, breaking down in the streams. As we move closer to within the channel margins, um, we can actually do things to reconfigure the stream channels. Uh, a lot of work being done in North America with insect floodplains or two-stage ditches. Um, these could be really good solutions um, where we have water levels that fluctuate enough that actually create small floods within the channel margins where sediment can accumulate on these benches that are planted with things like sedges where there can be a bit of uptake as well as denitrification. Um, and finally, we have within the stream itself where we might be able to add some organic matter. Um, each of these has its own sets of logistical challenges. And typically, these tools are implemented sort of in isolation. So we might think just repairing planting or just um, a bioreactor. But the opportunity that we have here is to combine these tools at these different locations within subcatchments. And so that's what I want to be talking about for the rest of the time today. Um, this was one of the experiments from my PhD where we took two of these waterways um, that I presented the load data for. One waterway uses a control. Um, it just had repairing grassy repairing margin, um, an incised channel, and, and the fence to keep uh, stock from entering the waterway. The treatment waterway was also similar. Um, so we sampled these along those one kilometer reaches that I talked about, measuring flow, measuring nitrate concentrations to get an idea of how flux was changing over time. So we had a year and a half of, of pre-rehabilitation data and then a year and a half of post-rehabilitation data. And so the, the treatment waterway received multiple steps and series of rehabilitation along this one kilometer reach. Um, and the way that we analyze these data to help control for some of the environmental variability um, by calculating effect sizes and using analysis of covariance, which I'll present shortly. So here's a look at some of those steps in that treatment waterway. Um, one of the first things we did was we gave the stream bank a more gentle slope. Um, it didn't make sense to put the plants up on a benched um, piece of stream bank that might actually fall in. Um, and also we wanted to have those plants closer to the water table where they might actually be able to uptake some of the nutrients. 
So establishing a more gentle stream bank, which also helps to reduce the risk of erosion. Um, we put in three bioreactors along this particular waterway. Um, and these were, these were put into places strategically working with the farmer who helped us identify two wet spots in the paddock that were problematic, where the stock were pugging out the soil, and where we also identified uplands of groundwater that we could intercept and treat. And then after the, um, the earthworks with the rebattering, we also involved the local community, the farmer um, and some of the neighbors, to come out and plant some sedges, plant some flaxes, and establish some native vegetation. And so this is looking down that reach two years after all that. Um, a year has gone past, and actually the sedges are now um, almost completely covering the waterway, providing good shade and cover. And all of this was possible um, because we had a landowner that was willing to work with us, willing to take some risks, um, willing to give up a little bit of land. In some cases, we moved the fence back an additional meter or two. So it was really important that we had this, the, um, the opportunity to take some risks and, and collaborate with the farmers. So now I'm going to walk you through some of the steps of, of how these systems are changing. Uh, I'll be showing some graphs that will have distance on the x-axis. So this is our one kilometer sampling reach. And in this case, I'm showing discharge on the y-axis. Um, and so we've got two hypothetical sampling periods, a pre and a post. The pre will be red, the post will be blue. These are what some data might look like from, from typical day sampling, um, where we've got stream discharge decreasing from upstream to downstream. The pre-period, we've got a higher discharge overall, and the post-discharge, it's slightly lower. But actually, if we look at this, these, these are fit lines that I'm showing, um, not raw data. We can see that those lines are parallel. And so we're using these lines, uh, we're going to use these as, a analysis for the, as, the, as the covariate in our analysis um, to control for this change in hydrology. The other part of flux besides measuring discharge is measuring nitrate. And so the same reaches, the same sampling period, um, it's possible that we could detect different changes in concentration. So in, concentration might be changing down the reach um, in, re in response to our rehabilitation measures. So we see a steeper increase in that slope in the post-treatment period, the blue slope. And so what we should see, in flux, we multiply this out, our flux lines should also be decreasing. They are. Um, and they're actually decreasing at different rates. So we have a greater decrease in flux post-treatment, and, and that's due to that um, greater change in concentration for the same hydrology. Um, so this was tricky for us to disentangle some of the, the variability in these systems. I'm going to show you what these raw data look like. Um, so we've got the treatment, the control waterway on the left, and the treatment waterway on the right. Distance is the x-axis, and flux is the y-axis. Um, so this is all of the sampling periods for the control waterway. Um, the control waterway was really useful to capture this noise, actually. Um, so it was extremely variable. Flux was sometimes increasing, decreasing. And we saw the same pattern in the treatment waterway as well. So when I looked at these raw data, I thought, crap, how am I going to analyze these? Um, because we would really like to see response in decreasing flux downstream. Um, and so we calculated a response variable as the ratio, the log ratio of flux from upstream to downstream. And so if you look at these lines, um, we use the upstream flux divided by the downstream flux to standardize for this change. So now I'm finally getting to the analysis after um, building up to it. Again, control waterway on the left, treatment waterway on the right. This time, the x-axis, I'm showing the slopes of those discharges. So moving from left to right, we go from losing water down the reach to gaining water. Um, and I want to point out that these are all minor changes. Most of these lines are actually really flat. They're really small, negative numbers. And the y-axis is that log ratio that I just explained. So numbers that are in the top half of the graph means we're attenuating flux downstream. We have less flux downstream than upstream. So we looked at this, these relationships in the control waterway, a model using um, time and these discharge slopes as our covariate. And we didn't find any impact of time. Um, there was an overall consistent relationship where discharge is what's driving flux. So essentially what this, um, this is a, a model fit in 95% confidence interval. The red data are samples from the pre-rehabilitation and blue or post. Um, basically what's happening is we're getting some attenuation at low flows um, when we have some losing conditions in, along the reach. But as soon as we start to get significant amounts of groundwater input around this zero, around this dashed line, um, the horse is already bolted. The little bit of riparian planting that's there, we're probably not going to stop this landscape level groundwater nitrate input. We use the same model in the treatment reach. Um, and we constrain the analysis to this left hand part of the graph where we had similar reach hydrology that we could compare. And so in this case, the red. We have two different slopes. We had a significant interaction of discharge and time. Um, what we see is we have the, the blue line and 
of being above the red line to the left, showing us that we actually had increased attenuation um, for a given set of flows, for a given set of hydrology. But actually, a similar situation where once we start to get out in this region, there's a lot of overlap in our confidence intervals, and we actually start to just gain nitrate down the reach. Um, so this was good. This showed us that we could actually maybe improve the status quo by combining some different tools in these different locations, but also um, sober us up a bit. Um, because actually, it's not just a farm level issue. We need to be working at the landscape scale um, and reducing nitrogen inputs on the land, which we know. So just to wrap this up, um, there's a lot of regional and local factors that we need to address and a lot of variability that's a challenge to monitor in rehabilitation. Thinking of these as systems and thinking about the impacts on the catchment level is really important to know if our rehabilitation is actually doing something in the end. And none of this is impossible unless we work with the farmers um, as scientists. So thank you to everyone on the team and um, to the landowners and supporting organizations. Okay, next we've got Jesper from University of Queensland. Thanks. Well, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, just a quick question, are there any other engineers here? Ah, good. Yeah. So uh, I've got two points to make, firstly as, a, as an introduction. First one is, this is the Mississippi River. It's flowing past uh, St. Louis, a city similar to similar to Brisbane in several ways. And the Mississippi River is hugely important to the US economy, and they spend the big bucks dredging it, building weirs and locks, so uh, barges like that, which are over 100 meters long, can go up and down. The Brisbane River used to be the backbone of Brisbane's economy. Uh, we used to ship freight up and down. It was a significant resource for uh, sand and gravel, but not anymore. And so unlike other cities which engineer their rivers to, for economic uh, purposes, we have the opportunity to engineer our river to uh, improve its health and boost its appeal. Now, a question I often get is, was the Brisbane River actually ever blue? Was it ever clearer? And the answer is yes, last year and the year before that. Uh, every year the Brisbane River actually gets significantly clearer than what we're used to, and people have begun to, to notice this. Now, the people behind this article went on to say that uh, this was all due to rainfall and that it wasn't going to last, this rain was going to come, the river was going to go brown, and uh, yeah. I like the, the brambling war this morning. Um, when there's heavy rain, seven minutes wash off the cat into the river, and the river goes brown. We all know that. But that, that doesn't mean that that's the reason why the Brisbane River is brown all year, or that the best solution to clearing up the Brisbane River is by restoring the catchment. So, this is a mud flat on the Brisbane River, and there's about 80 kilometres worth of these, although not many people are familiar with them. And this is at Jindalee, and you can open up every single piece of literature on the Brisbane River concerning sediment transport and your control find on mud flats, mud banks, intertidal banks, and you will get zero hits. Now I'll be demonstrating how important the mud banks are for in terms of the, the turbidity cycle within the Brisbane River, but also how important they are with respect to clearing up the Brisbane River. And this is fortuitous. The mud the way we can work with the mud banks is fortuitous because as an area, it is 10,000 times smaller than the catchment. And if you want to work on the mud banks, they're essentially a no man's land. You don't have to compete with agriculture, industry, or development. Right. So I'm not the first researcher to look at the, uh, the, the Brisbane River in, with the hope of clearing it up. But there have been few and far between, 
Now, the last one was in the year 2000, and they collected this data. This is data of turbidity. Now, turbidity is essentially a measure of how murky the water is. The higher the turbidity, the murky of water, usually the browner the water. And this data was collected for a year at Intrapilly, about 10 kilometers upstream of where we are today. And what we can see is that there's a large spike in February. That's your heavy rainfall. Then we see this up and down pattern uh, twice a month. That's the spring neat tide cycle. So when we start looking at this data, what we see is that, yes, the turbidity skyrockets when it rains, but it recovers very quickly. Then we have this interesting decrease in the gradual decrease in the turbidity over several months, and then the turbidity uh, jumps up in September didn't rain that September. Now these past researchers uh, realized that, uh, they ruled out the rainfall, but they weren't out able to explain why it jumped up. And so if we can figure out why the turbidity in the Brisbane River jumps up, and this happens every year, we see this decrease every year, we see the jump up every year, if we can figure out how, what process is behind that, then perhaps we can very faint arrow, very light blue arrow. Uh, perhaps we can stop it and uh, keep the Brisbane River clearer for longer. Right, so what might be um, responsible for this gradual decrease in turbidity in the Brisbane River if it's not uh, rainfall? On the lower plot we have the turbidity, we've just been looking at that. Above that is the tide which is covered with the angry red colours, that's a strong wind, and the whites and yellows, that's the calm winds. And what we see is that for several months of the year, we have these nice calm winds during high tide, and the turbidity gradually decreases. Again, the winds return, and the turbidity jumps back up. <coughs> so, how does this relate to the mudbanks? So instead of uh, showing another plot, I was going to show some photos. We have enough here. So the first one is very much similar to the one at the, the bottom, and that is taken when the turbidity in the river is high and the roots are exposed. Then we move to the right, and several months later, when the turbidity in the estuary is low and the roots are covered, the next year, the turbidity is high, same plants again, the roots are exposed, Several months later, when the uh, turbidity is low, the roots are covered. It's a process happening every year and it's lining up with the turbidity. So you might be thinking, well, two centimeters of mud on a mud bank, how can that possibly be making a difference to the, a significant difference to the Brisbane River? Well, actually, that's all it takes. And I can explain that later. So, we know that the, um, the turbidity cycle in the Brisbane River is being driven by the winds. When we have calm winds, the sediment is deposited on the mud banks and the turbidity goes down. Then when the winds return, and these winds are generating waves, the waves erode the sediment off the mud banks and back into the estuary and it sends ground here. So what can we do? Well, we can't stop the, the wind, but we can potentially block the waves. And a vegetation, a solution using vegetation would be would be just perfect. Now, perhaps some of you are thinking about mangroves. This is an estuary. Uh, researchers love mangroves. A lot of you guys probably love mangroves. I don't mind mangroves. But we we can look at a, a plant if we're looking for a new solution. We can look for plants that have been previously overlooked. And there's exactly one of these. It's, we call it the swamp lily or Crinum pedunculatum. It's already growing on the mud flats of the Brisbane River estuary. You can see some adults in the background and then you can see some young ones which I've planted. And you can see from the adults that they grow into a, a form that would be conducive to blocking waves or attenuating wave energy if they were planted in high density lines. So that's what we started here. And when they 
they grow into their adult form, in kinds that were prepared earlier by the Brisbane City Council. They grow into a hedge-like structure that will protect the mud banks from, from the waves. So, if we uh, want to clear up the Brisbane River, I'll just make like this play. To clear up the Brisbane River and boost its health and uh, its appeal and restore it to part of its former glory, we can um, recognise that the, the existing cycle in the Turbidian the Brisbane River is wind driven and that we can work with the river's capacity to transport sediment onto the mud banks, plant these plants in a way that will protect the mud banks from the waves. So there is a caterpillar that will decimate these plants if you plant them in high, uh, if you plant a lot of them close, close to each other. The great thing is they're in the intertidal zone, they get flooded twice a day, so yeah, no caterpillar problem, no pesticides, no nothing. Yeah. So why So that is what it takes, essentially. The mangroves uh, are growing there. The mangroves don't colonize much of the mudflats. These plants can be planted lower down. And they are, as you saw from the previous photo, colonizing those mudflats naturally, but that's a very slow process. And it is, um, the, it's, it's not enough. Westerlies that we sometimes get during the winter months have uh, lesser of an effect. They're a bit more gusty as well. So the one, the easterly components are.
Can you hear that? Um, so I'm from Western Australia. I work for a community group, Green Skills, that's been very involved in man care for many years and part of Gondwana Link. So just acknowledging my colleagues um, and also the funding bodies and also some of our project partners that have been part of this journey of wetland conservation, lakes and bird conservation. So um, just to show you where we when I'm talking about which area, it's the south coast of Western Australia, and the Gondwana link vision is, is for a landscape conservation scale project stretching all the way from the west coast near Margaret River across to the Great Western Woodlands. And the, the lakes are in the central zone where that arrow is, that, that's the Stirling Range National Park um, shown there with the, the lakes that we're talking about in this talk um, close to that. So. Um, I've been involved in land care for many years and been trying to get farmers to fence wetlands and lakes. Um, what's been a bit different about our approach in the last couple of years is trying to use flagship species to generate more, in, more and ongoing interest in the rural community. So the hooded plover is listed by the IUCN as vulnerable to extinction. WA is a stronghold. There's about 2,000 birds left. Um, Queensland and northern New South Wales has gone extinct. Tasmania is another small hotspot. But really, it's, it's one of our special shorebird species, resident ones. And um, BirdLife Australia has done great research and community promotion for many years. They've got an excellent wood site called My Hoodie. Um, wonderful information and actually citizen science monitoring that goes back years. So there's some very long data sets about what's happening to the species and what can be done in the different states. Um, for example, on the My Hoodie website, you can get all the information on how to age um, different individuals. So these are different, you can tell the different um, coloration and, and you can date them whether they're juveniles or older birds and so on. Great resource. Um, hasn't yet, yeah, in Western Australia, to lakes, this is a project which tries to link all that wonderful citizen science data that goes back many years to lake conservation. This is a typical example of, of, a, of the salt lakes we have in the North Stirlings area. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's not drained by a river. These, it's a very ancient flat landscape with these large salt lakes. There's another view of one of the lakes. So to the rural community, most of these are on fence from stock. Um, the vegetation has sometimes been cleared. And it, it gets quite difficult to say, well, why should we be encouraged, why should we fence them off? It takes a lot of money and resources and time to fence off these lakes and, and re veg them. So, hence the, the using of flagship species of hooded plover. Now, unlike Eastern Australia, our hooded plovers like to breed on salt lake shores, so rather than the beach, which are much more prone to disturbance from recreation users. So, we've got the opportunity to. Um, protect much more of our breeding habitat for hooded plovers by working with farmers. Um, what are some of the challenges for protecting the species? Here we've got, you can see the eggs are um, basically laid on the beach, on the sand, very, very vulnerable to stamping by you know, stock and sheep and cattle, um, and very, very prone to predation. Um, the young, which have to fend for themselves very early on, although the parents are still around, are extremely pr um, vulnerable to predation, not just by feral animals, but also by um, native predators as well. And of course, we all know that the challenges of introduced feral predators of foxes and cats. Um, what's interesting, when you start to work with farmers, you realize it's not just a matter of funding them baiting, because um, the, in this area, it's large acre, broad acre, 
wheat, um, cereal farming, and sheep farming. And you very quickly learn, once you get to form a relationship with these farmers, talking to them, is that um, one of the things that make it difficult for them to bait these lakes, even if, they, if we gave them the resources, is they often have sheep dogs. And, and so while they're happy to go out there and reduce fox numbers by shooting at night, they're very loath to be baiting. And it's, it's that sort of knowledge as eco-practitioners we need to bear in mind that we need to understand the agricultural systems that we're working in, not just the ecological systems. So um, he has other threat examples. A lot of the shorelines of these lakes are heavily damaged by stock grazing um, and other impacts, making it, you know, you, you think of what's the probability of, a, of, of nesting shorebirds surviving with that type of damage. Um, so that's the project area. Um, you can see the Sterling Range National Park on the south, the, the bottom corner. That covers about 60 kilometers, those lakes there. Um, it's, and um, what, what we realized that there were amateur shore um, bird watchers out there who've documented where these hoodies are breeding. And this goes back between 2005 and 2017, um, where there's 200 Pre, about 200 breeding pairs of hooded plovers in that area, which is a very significant proportion of the overall Australian population. Now, this data is absolute goldmine for those of us in the NRM sector because it exactly tells us where to prioritise um, limited fencing and other conservation resources. Um, these are some of the, you know, an example of the farming family that we work with. Graham Bradshaw and his partner, Rhonda Carnegie. They are you know, broadacre farmers, very busy, seasonally challenged, but keen to fence their bushland and, and do the right thing. So all they need is good technical info and, and some assistance and resources. Um, and in this case also, information about the wonderful bird life and the special birds that use their lakes. Um, so getting them involved in bird watching can be a great form of encouragement to, to make that next step of investment of their time in fencing. So um, the scale of farms are very significant. These are four to 5,000 hectare broadacre farms, and just three farms, farming families that we work with cover perhaps 40% of that whole target area. So if, you, if one can form effective relationships with those families, you're dealing with a very significant portion of the area. So in the last couple of years, we've cranked up the, the community bird surveys, the field trips, the community events. We've also helped a local NRM group, the Gillamai Centre, invest in a um, bird hide that's on a very accessible private, um, private lake, but, but publicly accessible. Um, so it's all about trying to interest the local community as a step to um, then the next action is taking up the fencing funds and reveg funds that we have. So this is a case study on a very significant lake, Tom South Lake, right next to a highway, a rural highway. Um, and the surveys that go back all the way to 2007 is that you can have huge concentrations of hooded plovers using this lake. So of course they are locally nomadic, but um, so what we did coming along was saying, well, we need to fence it. So it's adding to the, the, the work of bird life observers, but saying, let's take that data and turn it into action. So that was surveying and planning the fencing, um, mapping it all on GIS and starting the fencing. It's now fenced, and we've got some active citizen science surveys. We're going to try and use it as a good example of showing the benefits of fencing in terms of um, hooded plover, but also other shorebird work. If we can show that the numbers of juveniles that we observe over coming years increase, then we're well on our way to documenting the investment value of that fencing. The other key way is, of course, starting with the younger generation. With rural farm um, areas, you, you, know, you can reach almost the entire community. Um, here, the, we had, this is in July, we had about 40 students from the Cranbrook School, almost the entire school. Um, coming out and helping plant native species around a recently fenced lake. So, you know, they are going back to their families and passing on the message. So it's starting young again, but um, definitely they'll be the next generation of land managers. And that shows some of the, that's the lake that the fencing occurred on one of our participating farms. Another picture of, of this outing, including it's trying out planting um, islands of 
of vegetation, earth-built islands to try and increase the number of predator-proof or predator-protected um, habitat. Um, now, the value of a flagship species is that protecting it also protects a whole range of other species, and I think that's a common um, trend in, in our conservation action planning. So here we have the other resident shorebirds. These are ones that aren't migratory, the avocets and the stilts and the dotterels and so on. And then there's the migratory ones, um, you know, the, the plovers and, and the um, godwits and so forth. So these are ones, of course, that are protected by international treaties with our countries to the further north. And salt lakes in Western Australia can, at certain times of years and some seasons, be a really important um, hotspot for them. Protecting the, re the, the, the vegetation beside the lakes also protects all our songbirds and terrestrial birds, parrots and so on. And um, I, I thought I had a picture of some, some raptors as well, um, which show, so by you know, getting the farmers to um, protect their lakes, we're going to benefit a lot more species than just the hooded plover, but that's the flagship one. So what have been the results for this year? We've had seven lake projects and four farms, 14 kilometers of fencing and about 12 hectares of foreshore rebage, 12 bird habitat islands created, Tom South Lake, a very prominent lake, has been fenced and, and it will be surveyed. We've got good cran relationships with the Cranbrook NRM group and the local school. And we've got several farming families now engaged in bird watching. So um, I think it can work, this a way of using flagship species to drive the much bigger um, wetland and broader NRM programs that we want. Um, are we going for time? Chris, okay. What else did I want to say? Um, so all these projects take a lot of partnerships and you know we partner with Greening Australia, um, with the local NRM natural resource management groups that, that really benefit from, um, I'm not sure about, I imagine it's the same, especially in a time of drought. The, the local NRM and land care groups in rural areas away from the coast are doing it tough and so having coastal base groups like ours come in and help with these programs gives a real social boost as well. Um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions or discussion. Term. We, we on the south coast of Western Australia have got um, 25 years of, of shorebird data from citizen science work going back um, into the early 90s. Um, and that's long-term data that BirdLife Australia collates. And it, you know, that's the value of working in a state like Western Australia. So it's 1,200 kilometers of, of coastline. And from that data, you can pick out exactly where the hotspots are that need to be focused on, which are the estuaries and lakes that really have the high concentrations of risk. So that's, that's the sort of uh, definite highlight for me is how that data is used and what knowledge it's given us to allow us to really focus our efforts. Well, I think BirdLife WA has got its act together and Shore, Shorebird 2020. So those forms are all online. It's all online based. So I think a lot of thought's gone into that. I mean, we do a lot of monitoring that wouldn't really meet the, the scientific um, strict criteria, but I think the type of data that BirdLife is starting to collate is really, you know, and they're getting apps now for smartphones. I think it's exciting and it's going to make it easy to access that data in the future for really good scientifically verifiable, verifiable um, trends. Yeah, so it's a work in progress um, and um, haven't solved that one because you, shooting, you know, um, rural communities love to go out and shoot foxes. So, so there's the fox and cat shooting and, and local NRM groups work, organise shoots. Um, but that's not getting the numbers down enough. 
So that's why we're using techniques like trying to go for more islands and things like that, because that's less dependent on baiting. We do have one advantage in that 1080 is naturally occurring in our landscape, so we can use 1080 and it's not affecting our native fauna. So, so that's a slight advantage probably from what you've got. Yeah, well, everyone's still using 1080 anyhow. anyhow. Yeah, just and you know that you affect... Why, why dogs and cats are there, um, but either way, you just have to work with, get to know your local farm, farming systems. You've really got to know as much about agriculture as you do about ecology in, in trying to solve those problems. I'm happy to talk about it, We've, but um, yeah, it's not easy. Not on. Okay. Yes, so you may have been expecting Lisa Farnsworth here. Uh, she's my colleague at the Winter Wetlands Committee of Management. And unfortunately, her daughter had a medical emergency yesterday. And uh, so I, uh, I'd really very successfully um, uh, managed to um, uh, delegate this task to Lisa. But uh, unfortunately, the world uh, conspired. Uh, but um, yeah, so we, uh, we did write this together. So I should know some of this at least. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about, that's good, <laughs> that's a bit alarming, didn't, that, didn't do that on the, the area. I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the area that we're speaking on and also the traditional owners uh, of uh, the area uh, that I'm talking about, the Yorta Yorta Nations. Um, the, the area that I'm talking about is in Victoria um, and um, it's in, it's a really interesting thing that's happening there. Um, so it's in a, um, uh, a sort of a, a, a low valley uh, between Benalla and Glen Rowan. Glen Rowan, famous for uh, Ned Kelly. Ned used to actually walk, um, go across from the, 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 these Chesney Vale hills to Glen Rowan, I understand. Um, and, uh, but uh, the, the wetlands had a, a long history and, and in fact a history of dispossession as well, uh, which I'll talk about. So originally the site is um, obviously one of great uh, indigenous um, significance. So uh, prior to um, 1859, the area was known as McCohen uh, by the Yorta Yorta. It was a natural food, food bowl and um, it was a, a major meeting place. And there's evidence of Aboriginal occupation all over the site. Scar trees, there are ring trees, stone tools and even campfires still found in the mud. Um, at the site. Um, and as I said, it's really a, uh, a story, the a story of this site is a story of dispossession, the dispossession of the, the indigenous people when um, rural and uh, farming came in. The, the area was known as uh, McCowan Swamp, then renamed as the town that was established in the middle of the wetlands, uh, the town called Winton, and uh, therefore it was renamed as Winton Swamp, which is the major wetland that you could see. Uh, and it was obviously used for cattle and sheep grazing. But there were local schools, um, offices, um, churches, um, e even a, a butter factory, I understand. So uh, it was heavily used during the, that period, during that 110-year period um, for agriculture and, and Western uses. But, um, and also there was a fine series of wetlands, about 33 wetland basins, um, River red gum and cane grass um, swamps, largely. Um, but as it would have, there was also another stage of dispossession, dispossession from the farmers to uh, become an irrigation storage, and they created Lake McCohen in 1970. In 1969, the, um, the, some clearance was started and works to create a, a big 10-kilometre dam wall, and um, it was um, yeah, made as... Lake McCohen, it was a relatively shallow um, storage. Uh, much of the area was under two metres deep. Um, I think it got to about seven or eight metres in the, 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 um, in the deepest. It, it first filled in 1970, but um, one of its functions was not only as a local uh, reservoir, but it was also a drought 
um, storage and in the drought of the 82-3 um, it was drawn down to 5% of its capacity which exposed vast areas of, of, of the, um, the, the lake bed and um, dried and in fact killed the remaining um, aquatic vegetation which had established. Um, obviously in those 10 years there was something like 200,000 trees drowned um, and in those intervening years following 83 there was a series of turbidity increases, um, huge blue-green algal blooms um, and in fact at one stage um, really the, the water was not being able to be used um, from uh, month to month. Um, and so we went from wetland um, to, to lake and here's the lake here and we can actually see the um, um, blue-green algae starting occurring amongst the dead trees there you can see um, slightly better shot um, this is uh, microcystis, the toxic blue-green algae in fact it was regarded as one of the most toxic um, and um, yeah, very large blooms and quite significant. So there was a decision made um, in the mid 2000s to uh, decommission the storage and the dam wall was breached in 2010 and therefore there's actually been another series of dispossessions for the people the lake uses. Um, so the McCohen project started in 2010 um, and the area is now collectively known as uh, Winton Wetlands, although we are moving back towards calling the, the whole project the McCohen Project and in fact the site the McCohen Reserve as well. Um, but that's yet to happen. We need the Minister to agree to that. Uh, it's something like 9,000 hectares, 4,000 of that is rough, roughly is, is uh, wetlands and 5,000 is uh, swamp, red gum swamp and also box grassy woodland. It's a very significant site, has lots of species um, and so there's good reason to um, restore and renew the site. Um, so that's what it looks like now. In fact, I think that was it probably in 2017 um, after a, a nice fill. Um, and there are some contemporary sites from the shots and really the restoration project has gone underway. We've been very lucky in terms of the natural events that we've had. Um, so Broadly, the restoration project is really one that's been guided by a future land use strategy that was developed um, and also a restoration and monitoring plan back in 2011. And we've been following that plan and reviewing and updating that as, as we go. But broadly, it's about restoring the ecological function to the site, um, as well as improving the quality of the habitat that, that exists. Um, some, we've got some quite natural areas and some other areas that are very degraded. And so we need to really uh, improve the, those degraded areas and also increase, them, I suppose, the um, uh, diversity of the habitat that we've got. And that's probably one of the biggest issues. Um, we've also um, been working on connecting the, the habitat within the site um, uh, between uh, sub-parts of the site and also between that and the catchment. Um, and we've been working towards um, getting rid of some of the key threats um, such as the inv invasive species, the carp and the foxes. Um, and not only that, is we've also been working at the same time to really um, increase our understanding of how the system functions and we've been doing that through research with partnerships. Um, we've had a, an annual science, restoration science forum. We actually have been the second week of uh, August now for the last four years. We've just had the, the fourth one. Um, and uh, that information is on our, our website. The, um, and we also got quite extensive uh, community engagement through our friends group as well as um, a number of other groups and outreach. So really we're working with a whole lot of partnerships and also community engagement as a key part of the restoration project. So what have been the outcomes so far? So we've been working on restoring these naturally ephemeral area of wetlands. Um, we've been doing uh, quite a lot of active um, revegetation of uh, red gums and also the southern game, cane grass, which were the two sort of foundation species that uh, were found at this site. Um, I should have said that uh, one of those earlier pictures um, which showed the, the cane grass and red gums were we were very fortunate that Helen Aston, a botanist from uh, the um, 
uh, museum of uh, Victor, sorry, the herbarium of um, the, yeah, the Victorian herbarium, um, had actually done a quite a very good study back in the the late 50s of the site. So we've actually got some great pictures from that time as well as species lists that we can work towards um, re-establishing some of that. And um, so in terms of uh, red gum and um, cane grass, so the red gum is the red lines. We've been trying to restore the, um, the, the, the margins, red, gum, red gums around the margins of each of the wetlands as well as um, areas of um, aquatic plants uh, these uh, are a series of artificial ponds along the old dam wall um, called the McCohen Ponds and we've been trying to use aquatic plants in those because we've got relatively permanent water there as well as up in this duck pond again which is a constructed wetland. Um, and we've also been uh, establishing areas of cane grass um, in, um, in, in the... Um, uh, duck pond, pond and also around these uh, McCohen ponds as well. Um, so we've also been undertaking carp control. So we've been um, stopping the carp entering the, the system using a series of carp screens. Um, we've been electrofishing them uh, and uh, removing them. And we've also been engaging the community with uh, a whole lot of fishing um, trials uh, or fishing um, fish, you know, carp busting exercises. Um, we've also, so we've seen out of that uh, very um, good improvements in turbidity and nutrient levels. We've also seen changes in the species of fish. The, we've actually had an increase of small native fish in particular and actually our carp numbers have, are, are vastly reduced. Um, we've had some luck with drying as well that's helped control some of our carp. Um, and we've had a great increase in aquatic invertebrates and also aquatic macrophytes within the wetland, um, and in particular uh, cane grass and, myri and myriophyllum. So this is what it looked like in 2016 after the big, uh, big fill, and um, we were fortunate to get great cane grass regeneration, um, some of our red gum regeneration through um, our direct seeding. Um, and uh, also in the drawdown in 2016, we had great large areas of myriophyllum, red myriophyllum, which is this plant out here. Um, we didn't have that this year, uh, which is interesting, but we had a different drying cycle this year. Um, but uh, yeah, there's large areas of cane grass through here, and uh, this is typha, which we, uh, we have two minds about. Uh, but anyway, uh, typha could be a threat as well as a uh, a, a, a nice re-establishment. It was there originally. Um, we've got uh, permanent um, uh, ponds along the dam wall, as I said before, and we've got some good fish populations there. That's one of our Murray cod. We know them very well. We've got some, um, quite a few large ones. So, three minutes to go. Um, so, we've, what else have we done? Well, we've planted about a, a thousand or hundred thousand trees, um, largely uh, box woodland and also red gums. We've also put in place uh, 170 nest boxes for chewins and squirrel glider habitat. Um, we've been uh, managing the weeds and also foxes and rabbits on the site. Uh, in terms of our revegetation efforts, the green here, not marked down here, is the, the wetlands uh, box and red gum uh, plantings. But we've been working with the friends to do a series of uh, other woodland plantings. Uh, the Golden Broken CMA uh, to do uh, sandhill uh, revegetation along this uh, the, the old spit or the lunette, which is a, um, a very significant site, uh, and also the Region Honey Eater project, um, who have been working um, within our site and also uh, around the site uh, to produce corridors for the Region Honey Eater bird. Um, We've also been um, doing a lot of direct seeding um, and we've, got, we've had um, some quite extensive trials and uh, planti plantings uh, with direct seeding with a mixture of species. Um, there were some direct seeding done back in the late McCohen days, uh, which are right on the margins of the, the reserve site uh, for obvious reason. And these have been interesting because they're actually not necessarily locally native species um, and uh, we've been... Um, um, concerned about whether we should be keeping them or not keeping them. They're also very dense, 
Um, so we've been monitoring a whole uh, range of species within them, but actually that's where we've been finding the chewins and, and, um, and those small mammals as well. So um, we're uh, yeah, hastening cautiously on those. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we've had a lot of use of the nets, next boxes. Um, the uh, revegetation is proceeding well. I think I need to keep going. Otherwise, um, just some examples of that. And um, we've also, as I said before, we've been doing a lot of research with um, partners. So we've done surveys on the site. We've done seed bank uh, uh, vegetation seed bank studies. We've uh, done surveys of the vegetation. We had a series of um, projects with uh, Deakin University looking at red gums and um, that's been quite successful in um, developing some methods that we've been able to use to um, get re red, red gum regenerating on a site which was one of the big problems um, and obviously the cane grass species as well. Um, we had a whole series of uh, different projects um, going. I'll keep going through these. Um, yep, I need to finish. Okay. So I'll, if you want to hear about our turtle project or our growling grass frog, I'm happy to talk about that. And um, I'm just trying to get the, the last slide up. But basically, yeah, we'll be focusing on many of those same things. And I'll finish there since it's...